Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Marla Gordon, the Director of Clinical Services here at Kendall at Home. And we are pleased this morning to have with us Tom Sawyer from the Cleveland Site Center for today's Healthy Aging Matters discussion. Um, today, Tom will be discussing information on how we can maximize our vision and what tools and technology can assist for individuals with vision loss in performing their activities of daily living. So Tom, thank you so much for being with, here with us this morning. I will turn it over to you. I know you have a lot to share, so I don't wanna waste any more of your valuable time. All right, Marla, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. So sure. let me just get to my slides. All right, so what a world it would be if you could see what I could see. Now, I've worked with tens of thousands of people across the state of Ohio, but our, our service area is the nine counties in Northeast Ohio. But uh, knowing what people see and what they don't see can be transforming for us who are sighted, because I'm showing you a picture here of water lilies on the Japanese bridge by Claude Monet. And uh, you may not have realized that there was a, he had at least one uh, vision uh, struggle, whether it was cataracts or retinal disease, but it made a difference in how he would see things. And what a wonderful picture it is. And I'm sure that we've all enjoyed it through the years. I know I have, but uh, it can really make a big difference. Now, this one is a little bit different. William Turner's a masterpiece. Now, those of you who may not be familiar with cataracts, cataracts kind of give you a, anyone who lives to 75, you've got a 50% chance of getting a cataract. By the way, I've had cataract surgery already this year, uh, January and March. I wore glasses for 59 and a half years, and uh, now I only need them once in a great while. But anyways, the cataracts will make everything look milky and obscure your vision. It can get very, very bad. And a lot of people will stop doing activities because it's just very difficult. Uh, and this, even though I knew about it, it snuck up on me. So I want to tell you that's not on this slide, but if you're 60 or over, get an annual eye exam. I only missed one year during COVID, and I went from having no cataracts to advanced cataracts. So not only that, but there's other medical information they can get when you're having uh, eye exam as well. So, but we'll back to William Turner. So envision, if you will, that this artist master painting this picture, but only seeing a very milky kind of view. And now you might see in here, it says on the way to the, or going to the ball. Now, this is probably ships or boats going on the water, but it may not be. But the fact is, is that that's what he perceived. And that's what he went and we, we celebrate that as a masterpiece, or at least some might celebrate that as a masterpiece. But at any rate, so just kind of a different idea for what, uh, what cataracts might look like. So I wanted to get in now to some of the things that can actually affect cataract, uh, exacerbate the onset of cataracts, which is smoking, uh, refusing to wear your glasses, uh, neglecting your veggies, and forgetting your sunglasses, and staring at the screen with no breaks. Now, there's a couple of reasons, breaks meaning looking away. There's a 2020 rule, and I'm on number five now, staring with a screen. There's a 2020 20 rule. If you're on your computer for 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Now, that's not as important, but optometrists came up with that. So you can understand why it would be a 2020 rule. But our eyes have mus our muscles. They have muscles holding the, the, our gaze. And just as though you would hold out your arms to your side for 20 minutes, they would get tired, they would get fatigued, your eyes get fatigued. So looking away at a different distance changes that whole thing. Now you say, what about wearing? What, what's the thing about wearing sunglasses? Well, the sun can really affect uh, a lot of different things in your eye, the blue light coming into your eyes, as well as just, just not generally good. So you want to wear a visor uh, as well, or sunglasses that come from the top, especially if you were working outside, 
or being outside and your glasses come down your nose a little bit. And I'm working backwards now to three, neglecting your veggies. Now you say, well, what is that all about? Well, I've got to tell you, this is not necessarily about cataracts, but this is about another eye disease. 12 to 14 years, 14 years ago, it was that I was diagnosed with pre-macular degeneration. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, but uh, macular degeneration is losing central vision. So you full blown, you couldn't see your face in a mirror, but mine was pre-macular degeneration. They cut it really early. And while we are not a medical facility as far as doing operations and giving shots and things like that at the Cleveland Science Center, we do dispense eye drops and things through our optometrist and low vision clinic. So I can't say we're non-medical, but um, there's nothing necessarily to say this is what we're to do. And so I went on um, a diet. I, I was very much interested in nutrition for many, many years, but I went on an extreme uh, nutritional hunt for the for the most uh the best foods dark green leafy vegetables rich in the antioxidants from flavonoids flavonoids and a variety of their photochemicals phytochemicals excuse me uh, and just a variety of things and within nine months now this was pre macular i hadn't lost any vision within nine months when i went back they said, well, we don't see anything just from viewing, but they said, let's go look with, through the camera with the, with the computer and, and check it out. They couldn't find anything within nine months. Now I did exercise program and I did a number of a few extreme exercise program and a few other things, but that turned it around 10, 12, 14 years later, I still don't have any macular degeneration or premacular degeneration. I did get cataracts, however, but you can get those at any time. I've known people that have had three eye diseases. But where, and now we're going to go to number two. We're going working backwards to refusing to wear your glasses. Well, the eye strain there again can really be devastating. And number one, smoking, or smoking has a lot of horrible, horrible uh, residual uh, effects on people. So uh, it's just not good for your eyes. And it, that does really uh, hasten cataracts, I believe. And I'm I'm a former smoker, but I stopped 40 some years ago. So legal blindness. Now, on the one side where it's blurry, that's 20 over 200. That's what it looks like at best scenario for someone who is legally blind. That's best scenario. That doesn't show where there might be diabetic retinopathy, where they've got, they've only got little spots in that whole picture that they might see like that. Or, um, or glaucoma where they might they might only see central or macular degeneration where they might only see the peripheral and then 20 over 20 on the other side. So the legal definition is acuities of 20 over 200 or less in the better eye with the best correction possible and the, or the vision loss of 20 degrees or less. So what that means is, and we've, I've heard so many people say, when I take off my glasses, I'm legally blind. Well, you can't be. There's the legal definition with the best correction. So if you're legally blind, you have to be legally blind with the glasses on. And if you take them off, you're still legally blind. But you cannot take your glasses off and say, I'm legally blind. So here's kind of an idea. It's, a, it's an ophthalmologist rendering of um, loss of central vision. This is uh, looks like the Apollo space shuttle team or something like that. But uh, anyways, the bottom it progressive down at the bottom of the third to the, the bottom screen uh, is a photo with a face obscured and the other faces on the outside kind of blurred. Well, if you had macular degeneration, you wouldn't see like that. You wouldn't see that face at all. You would see blurry on the sides because of peripheral vision, depending on corrective lenses and whatever else you might have going on. But you wouldn't see that beige uh, with no feature face. You would just not see anything. Now, there is a juvenile form of macular degeneration called star guards. So, so what, what we do, we help people find independence to achieve it through education, empowering and employing. We have all different types of training, whether it's in the community, in your home, at our facility. But really what we do before anything is we have to give hope before we can offer help. Because when the eye doctor says that glasses, I can't help you with glasses anymore, can't change your prescription to be any better, 
that's when it's time to talk to us. Maybe before as well, but when glasses aren't enough, it's kind of the kind of the rally and cry uh, for saying, I need some help looking at things a different way. Now, at some point, we may be able to help change that prescription just a little bit to help you a little bit more. Uh, but generally, uh, it's going to be through other things that we help people see better with the vision they have. So Cleveland Sight Center's mission is to empower people with vision loss to realize their full potential and to shape the community's vision of that potential. Now, that full potential may be making coffee at first. Now, that's not to set the expectation that making coffee is all a person who is visually impaired or has uh, uh, blind would do. But what happens is that, and that uh, ophthalmologist said, you're losing your vision. It's almost like a death sentence. It's definitely mourning for you. You have to go through the grief process of losing some of that vision and, and follow through that. But you just, you start thinking, I can't do anything. I can't do anything. And then you may sit and wait two hours for somebody else to wake up just to make a cup of coffee when you have the ability, not knowing it yet, but you have the ability on how to do that without using your vision. But then when you learn how to use some of these things that we'll talk about in a few minutes, say, I can apply that to other things. So you can do virtually anything. I work with people at the agency who are visually impaired and totally blind but only three to 4% of those who are legally blind would be considered totally blind. They have some light perception, finger perception. There's a number of different things it could be. When, well, you saw the picture there, it was blurry, but you still could discern some of the things that were in that picture. But, uh, and then to shape the community's vision because the narrative is, is that, well, being around a person who is vision loss it may not be safe for them. They're, they're, they're in danger all the time. Well, that's not necessarily true. They have a great presence of awareness because they're, they're focusing on all their other senses as well. So they can do, and I think I've said this already, but I, I like to reiterate, is they can do anything that we can do, perhaps not drive at this point, but in the near future, we may not be driving either. So, oops, sorry. So we are dedicated to helping our clients live well with vision loss. So if your vision is such that stopping you performing one daily activity, you can register as a client. Now it doesn't cost anything to register as a client. Our services are not free. Uh, we are a nonprofit agency and less than 10% of, of our total budget comes from state funding, which I'll talk a little bit about. There is a there is a couple of programs that opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities is are funded through the state with that for different, they have criteria because with any funding of state funding, there's a certain criteria, but we help, we help people regardless uh, if they have one daily activity that they're not able to do, whether it's reading because of lighting, reading because of magnification, which is different than the state programs, but we've never ever turned anyone away from services because they couldn't pay. We raise funds to help that happen when people can't afford to pay. So, so we are a vision rehabilitation agency and there's all kinds of clinical things that we could say, but I'm gonna give you some examples of things. And this is generally geared towards the senior population, but not necessarily. Was we, we actually work with everyone from one day old and the oldest person I worked with was, uh, well, when I worked with them, they were 102, but they're, I say 106 because I've known them after that, but 102 is when I worked with a person. So examples of some of the things that we can help people do, start reading again. One of the things, if you're starting to lose your vision, don't stop reading, even though that it's a struggle. Because when you stop doing that, and you find that, you say, there may be some equipment, or you may contact Cleveland Sight Center if you're in our service area, and find out there's all different types of things you can do. And then what happens is when you get this equipment or whatever it might be, you struggle because you can't read the same way that you did because you've lost the ability to sight recognize even though you can't see quite as well and i've seen this personally working with one on individuals one-on-one -on -one, uh that's a it's a problem no it comes back fairly quick 
but still that's one more struggle you don't have to put up with if you can if you can just keep trying to read as you as you as you do uh, lose some of your vision so you can still write your checks you can check your bank account you can keep track of your own appointments learn how to use a smartphone in a computer in electronic devices you probably wouldn't think that that's possible now i'm not talking just about a flip phone i'm talking about a phone that has the icons on the screen well how is it possible that you can use those icons if you can't see well iphones are in this case are superior to android phones as far as your ability to do certain things it's not Siri. You can ask Siri to do things on an iPhone, uh, which is like an assistant. But it's also iPhones have something built in called voiceover. So what that's like is that you just touch the screen anywhere. And it'll announce not where you're touching. It'll announce the different things that are on the screen. And you swipe across it with your finger. And when you get to what it is you hear they, they, they say, voiceover says you would double tap and that would select it and then you might have to swipe up to go through all the files it's like going through a four drawer file cabinet i tell a lot of people is imagine a four drawer you find the drawer first of all and then you flip through the files and you say oh this is the file but then you still have to open it up to access what's in it so it's like different hand gestures um, computers can be used to a little tip here now there, there is software, magnification software, and uh, screen readers for computers for people who are blind or low vision. But before you go and spend a lot of money on uh, enlarge, screen enlargements, magnification on with software, because they generally cost four to $600 to do that, which may or may not be horrible, but there's something better anyways. And I always told people, even when I represented this particular software as part of what the whole package that we, we represent, is that get a larger monitor, larger television. Now, I don't mean a 65 inch television, I don't mean a 48 inch tele television, but if you have a laptop or if you have a computer and you're having trouble with your 18 or 20 or 24 inch screen, plug it into that larger television monitor for the moment. And if you see how much better that helps, but then you would get a designated 28 to 32 at the largest, 28 to 32 inch uh, monitor. The reason why I say that is because if it's too big, if you only have a restricted view, it gets too big and you can't see it. And you can't get far enough away because you need to be close to see it. So what these icons, when you go to a 28 or 32 inch screen, it makes the icons larger. So if eventually you do lose more of your vision and you need to get that magnification software that will make it bigger, you don't have to go all over the screen like you see your grandkids do. You're, they're kind of using their finger all over the screen trying to maneuver over their little phone. Well, you'd have to kind of do that with the your computer as well if you made it really large at first so get a larger monitor a 28 the 32 and that's less expensive than the magnification software too plus it's it just works better to begin with and it saves a lot of hassle uh learning something really new because you're just plugging it in and the icons are going to be by ratio larger okay so we also help you prepare and cook foods uh with confidence take a walk when you want to know what time it is and you don't need to ask others or pick out your matching outfits on your own not just with technology there's de there's there's devices that you can put against your clothing and it'll tell you the color but it won't tell you don't wear those out today i won't do that but it will uh, it will it will tell you the color but there's strategies depending on whether you have three pairs of the same pants and they're different colors you may designate with putting a safety pin in the pocket in the hem, in the belt loop, whatever it might be. There's all different types of little strategies like that. Well, big strategies, really, but they're small things that you do need to do. Uh, get and stay organized is a, is a thing. When somebody loses their vision, organization is much harder because keeping track of where they've set everything or, or where things are when people move things, because that happens a lot. People move things and then Nobody know the person doesn't know where it is. So uh, that can be very important to stay organized. So you regain confidence in your ability to complete tasks uh, and learn necessary skills to stay safe in your home.
Now, whenever I bend down, if I, and I don't have vision loss at this time, but I work in the garden a lot, things like that. Sometimes these things you may not be paying attention to. So whenever I bend over forward, I put my hand in front of my face and I, I kind of go down. Like so if there's something there, I feel it before I go down. It's just a habit I've gotten into because I've worked with so many people who have vision loss and say, They've either said, I bent over and hit my go only good eye and lost the vision I had, or I've fallen because I didn't, that's a different scenario, but same idea that they're bending over looking and they lose their balance. So, but be thoughtful about some of the things you do, protect the vision you have. Like, while I don't wear glasses now, when I cook, I wear safety glasses when I cook because I don't want something spattering in my eyes. We get, if we lose our vision, we don't get it back generally. There's very few times it gets back. And, it, and if they have to do something mechanically, as far as putting something in your eye, at some point that may become obsolete. So it's better to take care of your vision while you still have it rather than trying to fix it afterwards. So, so I'm gonna give you some tips, techniques, and tools for living well with vision loss. I've mentioned that we were a vision rehabilitation agency, which we've just gone over some of the things. We started in 1906 helping people. So lighting, does it make a difference? Well, direct sunlight is full spectrum lighting. When it shines through the windows or overhead, it can be good, but when it's in your eyes, it can actually cause, be problematic for cataracts or different things like that, or stop you from seeing as well as you can because you're not controlling the light. So different light, different magnet, different reflections, I should say, um, and different things like that can be, can be bad, but lighted magnifiers can be good. So there's a number of reasons why to use light. And so it depends on the type of light, what you're doing and for how long. But what I would say generally is, is if you're doing any type of task, reading, writing, uh, crossword puzzles, whatever it might be, which would be writing, I guess. So, but uh, is keep the light below your eyes if it's in front of you. And if you're using a floor lamp, make sure that it's behind you, not over the side of your vision or beside you, but behind you, come, the light coming over your back and illuminating what you're working on. The reason why is the light doesn't get into your eyes. Now, there's one other thing. You may have gotten into a habit, which is a wonderful habit of sitting in front of the window at your desk, uh, looking out the window, but then you do some tasks. Well, when that light comes in, that affects how you see the tasks that you're doing. So if you are doing a task, it's much better to either close the blind, the drapes or whatever at that point, or turn your back to the window and let that wonderful light come in over your shoulder. Again, either one. Some people, some people say, I thought it was the left shoulder. I thought it was the right shoulder. Well, it doesn't matter which shoulder. It's just uh, whichever one works for you best. So just watch what you're doing there now. So, and lighting can be problematic for, you might recall, we mentioned macular degeneration and star guards. It's the ju juvenile form uh, of that. So blue light is probably very difficult for you to get blue light that's going to do this to any great degree, but I still want to tell you about it. Blue light comes into your eyes from the sun, from fluorescent lights, from phones, from electronic devices. And if you get enough, which is hard to do, so I don't want to sound like it's a, like it's a bell you can't, you can't, warning bell that you just can't do all of these things, but it will destroy the central vision, central cells you central vision, just like macular degeneration, uh, the effects of macular degeneration. So if you have a smartphone and it's an Android, probably after the Android 8 issues, I know mine is, is that they have a blue light filter. Now, just because your phone has a blue light filter doesn't mean that it's turned on. You need to go in and enable that blue light filter. Now, iPhones have put it, but I think they've put it in a, in a little trickier place. It might be in night mode. It might be in some different things. It's not quite as easy to identify. So if you're having trouble, ask your family or call Apple to find, you know, an Apple store to find out if your phone has a blue light filter. And if it doesn't, and you don't want to get a new phone, you may be able to get a, 
a topical thing that you can put on a, blue, a filter on top of your screen to help with that. So there are there are those types of screens out there. So just think about that. There's also glasses. Now our idea shop sells those glasses, but we're not in the business of selling things just to sell things. We're in the we're in the business of helping people and even enabling people and empowering people to do what they want to do. And if, the, if we have something that, that works for them and they want to purchase it, that's fine. But we don't, we don't sell it, if you will, in the same manner as what uh, the product of the day kind of thing, just get rid of product of the day. So blue light screens can help. Now, here's some different lights. Now, these particular ones are at light, but because of uh, a lot of things that are going on these days with uh, supply chains and a variety of things that they some of the lamps may not look like that in our store but you want to get a full spectrum light is what you want to get um and now that does have blue light but you keep it below your eyes or behind your back that's what full spectrum is sunlight and if you want to know if a full spectrum light will help you or not remember i talked about that window where the sun might be coming in well now i want you to go up to the window turn your back to it let that sun come over and while you're reading something and see if that makes a difference, if that helps you with seeing what you can see with that full spectrum light. And you may be using a magnifier already, but some of those magnifiers may not be working for you anymore. But take those with you when you go over by the window, because sometimes this happens to be light. Working with individuals that I did for many years, I found in one case, one particular case, who just started using a magnifier within the year, is that when she used the light properly in the proper light, both, she didn't have to use a magnifier at all. But generally what happens is using proper lighting the right way, correct way, um, you may not need as strong a magnification. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because the stronger the magnification, the smaller the magnifier lens. It's not the bigger. We all see on TV in different places where they have got this big, magnifier well that's a very low power magnifier it's not it's not a high power magnifier so uh, regular manual magnifiers if you will that have certain lenses they, they you can't change the magnification but they're they're meant to certain criteria they're they're produced i should say for certain criteria so the smaller the harder it is to see things so contrast can be extremely important. We all sometimes miss things on counters that it just seems like either we just kind of took a quick look or they just blend in or if it's low light. So you may not want to change your countertops if all of you've got light colored kitchen, kitchen tools, like spoons and all those different things. But you may want to put a placemat down. You may want to put some other, some contrasting material, black, uh, that you can set things on uh, so you can see them and you can pick them up. So then you may end up purchasing white spatulas or whatever it might be that would be a high contrast. So you can see those a little easier. Uh, whether it's cutting boards, there's a black side cutting board and a white side cutting board. Well, why? Well, a person with some vision loss won't see a white onion on a white cutting board. And actually, a red tomato on a black cutting board isn't that special either. It really is better on the white side of the cutting board. So it can be the dinnerware. Now, a lot of people say, well, I'm having trouble pouring coffee. And, uh, and I might say, well, well, do you use a black cup when you pour coffee or a dark cup? And they say, well, yes. And they say, you drink your coffee black? And they say, well, yes. Or I add cream after. And they're having trouble uh, seeing how to fill up their cup with coffee. Well, use a white cup. Uh, don't put the uh, put the cream in first before you start doing it if you don't. But there's also some tools. There's a little device that we're gonna get into until later. It's called liquid level indicator that will make a tone when you pour in your coffee and it comes to the top. But let me give you a little hint about a couple other things or one other thing. When you're making coffee, if you're having difficulty for whatever reason for spilling some of the water in your coffee maker, whether it's your hand, your ability to pour uh, accurately, or whether it's your vision, get a larger tray like a cafeteria tray or a cookie sheet that's got a lip on the side. Put your coffee maker in that, uh, set it on that. And so when you pour the water, all the water will be contained in that cookie sheet. 
And that way it'll be much easier to clean up because if you do have vision loss, you may not see that water on your counter and end up it running off and you're stepping in it or you may slip and fall even. So, and that same thing works for if you're filling, you're pouring your coffee, put it on a, 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 a smaller sheet or even a saucer or a bowl or whatever it might be, something to contain that. And I would even submit to you that if you're cooking or baking in this case, and you were using flour or some other dry mix that you were measuring and you were missing the uh, measuring cup, that if you had that baking sheet or some other flat surface that would contain the dry mix, you could then repurpose that dry mix or put it back in or whatever you needed to do, or even at least clean it up much easier. So these types of things, work surfaces, cutting boards, dinnerware, black plates, white plates, depending on the food, um, placemats, you may say, well, I've got a white table or I've got a glass table and I have a glass plates because we have a lot of companies so we just use glass plates or whatever it might be, but use a, use a placemat that's con contrasting so that it would happen. Um, also printed materials as far as contrast can be very important uh, how it's printed. So here's some other contrast things. So we've got measuring spoons, so we've got uh, keyboard stickers that can be put on so you don't have to buy a new keyboard. They're, they're larger and you can get them in black uh, background with white as opposed to the other way around. I think you can get them in yellow black as well. Playing cards, large, uh, we still call a large print for the watch as well. So I'm trying to watch my time here a little bit because I get carried away. So large, here's the large print. Now, large print, and then it says large print, and then it says large print. That's all about, I believe, 20 times uh, fonts, uh, point type size, I should say. And, but they're different fonts, and so it makes a difference. And if you have vision loss, the second large print and the third large print are, don't do as well as the first large print on the top, which is Arial. So that works real well. And while many times people who are, have lost a significant amount of vision really could see better with a black background and white letters, it's not comfortable for them or they're not used to it. So they still stay with the black print on white. Uh, background, but high contrast is much better. Like if you're reading boxes of things or instructions, lots of times they'll have like a yellow background and light blue directions or different things like that. It can be very difficult to be able to read. So, and also if you're if people are doing things for you and writing things down, but they start doing little doodles on the side to think that they're giving you a better idea of what they've written, that actually is visual clutter and it makes it, it, makes it worse. So keep the visual clutter to a, a minimum. And if they're using wor use words less than 10 letters in length, the reason why is if you're using a magnifier, you, you're not reading four to six letters at a time. You're reading one letter at a time and trying to discern each one many times, if it's the way that you would have to do it with a regular manual magnifier. And so by the time you get done, you may not remember all those letters. And still, just the fact of you know, comprehension of what you read may be very difficult. So we're going to skip to communications now. So if you've lost some vision, or you somebody you know might have lost some vision, or more importantly, in some cases, people you don't know have lost vision. And so you start waving to somebody, but you don't say, hi, Frank, this is Tom, and they don't wave back. It may mean, may mean that they're denying or they're hiding that they've lost some vision, and they don't know who you are, so they don't say anything back, or they may say an unenthusiastic, hi, Kind of thing and say, well, why didn't he say my name? Well, you didn't say your name either. But uh, so always announce yourself. Uh, let the person also, if you're leaving, when I leave a room, when I'm, again, I work with people and uh, at the agency here, and also work with people in general, I say I'm leaving because what happens sometimes is people who are visually impaired, especially if there's ambient noise in the room, they may not know you've left, you may have stepped away for a minute, and they're talking, and another person comes over and says, who are you talking to? And they say, well, I'm talking to Frank, and they go, well, Frank's not here, and so then they feel like they've been isolated and put out onto the side, that it was not important, so always, when you're 
when you approach a person, say it's Tom, and when you're leaving, I'm leaving now, Tom's leaving now if there's a group. Uh, so also, you might might not realize this, but we use a lot of gestures. I'm shaking my head right now, but see, I just said I'm audio describing shaking my head because you can't hear gestures, nonverbal gestures. And so let's take a little scenario here. There's a, there's a small party going on and there's a, there may be a kind of the party clown that might do something, but it's not, a, it's not an audible thing that they're doing. It's a gesture and everybody laughs. But the person who has vision loss has no clue what's laughing. So they start wondering, am I, is, my, is my blouse or shirt buttoned up or whatever it might be? Do I have food going or whatever it might be? All these things. And that person now who has vision loss has been, is no longer, even though they're sitting in the group, they no longer as though they feel that they're sitting in the group. They've been put off to the side, outside on the periphery, the fray. They're the other people now. They're not the group. And so I think hopefully you can kind of get an idea how that might disenfranchise them from um, things. So also, if you don't clap or make loud noises sudden without letting somebody know before you do, if you're around people with vision loss, because it can be very startling. And I have a habit of make, moving my hands, but you may have experienced those of you who have vision may have experienced at one time in your life black light. So it kind of looks like it. Uh, goes in little segments like uh, screen slipping or slides that's going through. Well, for a person with macular degeneration, they can see parts. And so they may see your hand at first, and then they may see it way over here, but it may look as if it's coming towards them. And they, whoa, kind of go back. And the, it, it's very startling or disconcerting. Again, it can be. So don't move your don't do a lot of erratic behaviors or snap your hand or clap your hands or even snap your fingers really without saying you're going to make a noise i would say i'm going to make a noise i'm going to make a loud noise um, and if you're with somebody that you know has vision loss describe the surrounding that's called audio describing points of interest and we're going to touch on that a little bit more here in a minute but audio describing it might be the flowers are in bloom they're across the patio and i'm going to use the clock method at two o'clock analog clock and we'll talk about that in a minute as well across the patio the uh fox, fox glove are just coming into bloom if they're just beautiful across the patio so the person know it knows that it's not right there but it's across they may say well let's go over to it now why would that be important because that person may not know that there's flowers there. They probably wouldn't know they were in bloom. And this gives them opportunity to experience more of the world that they live in rather than just traveling through. So understand, and I tell people when I'm doing training, blindness basics training and etiquette, that when you're working with a person or giving sighted human guide is another term of helping a person who's visually impaired go through, you're not delivering a FedEx package. You're not saying, I'll take you there, drop you off, and that's it. That's not the business of that. If you're engaging with a person, engage with a person. And so, oh, these flowers are beautiful, or watch your step here, or they just put a new rug in over here, or whatever it might be. And that brings that person into the conversation. It brings them into the world that you're both in, rather than them just traveling through with you. So, and that clock method will describe anything, and we're going to get to that now. Now, the heading says verbal and audio cues, and then I have a picture which seems strange in a way, uh, it's an analog clock. Well, the analog clock are audio cues. Now, the audio cues are, is the sighted person telling the person with vision loss where things are. Now, here's the secret. The person with vision loss is always at six o'clock, not in the center where the hands are. I know every, some people are going to say, why not in the center? Well, we can't get into that. We don't have enough time, but suffice to say that that is an anchoring point. Six o'clock is an anchoring point. So the person who is visually impaired is at six o'clock. Now you can use that for food on the plate. Your mashed potatoes are at three o'clock and your chicken is at nine o'clock and your green beans are at 12 o'clock or whatever it might be so the person would know but that same audio describing with the with the clock method was used for the patio the flowers or a variety or let's say you're you're in a you're in a theater or some some place where there's chairs behind let's say frank's Frank's behind you at five o'clock, not beside you, because five o'clock was normally be beside you, but Frank's in the row behind us at five o'clock. So 
the person with vision loss would turn around and say, hi, Frank, and know where Frank is. Um, so understanding that gives a great dimension. Again, it opens up the world to people. But there's 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 also different things that will that's as far as we're going to go with a clock method. If you have if you have interest, you definitely can contact me at Cleveland Site Center and I can get you a, a number of different things that to help you with people with vision loss. Uh, it's called a, a blindness and low vision toolkit. That's something that you want to get more information on. And there's no cost. I would just send it out electronically with all the different forms. So, but um, sounds can be helpful. A uh, number of different things you may not even realize. Sometimes if you're, if you're using your computer and you click on something and it says, it might say sub menu or something like it, maybe I have a some type of text or something. But us who are sighted may not, think anything of it because we can see that there's a sub menu but a person who may not see that would sub menu would mean that they could click on that sub menu or get to that sub menu and so it's a navigate kind of a navigation tool then there's devices that can talk and we're going to get into that in a minute here but then there's also a sighted guide there's a right and a wrong way to do it you don't ever push people you don't drag people um we're not going to be able to go over much of any of it today, but there is a definite way to do that, even approach the person if they need help. But let's get to the next one. So there's talking products, there's talking clocks, there's talking calculators. There's there's apps on your smart that can be put on your smartphone that don't cost anything extra that will be able to take a picture of written text on a paper and read it to you aloud. And it can also read text, the voiceover on your iPhone can do that. But there's Microsoft Seeing AI, which is a free app made by Microsoft for Apple products, which is kind of a, uh, if you one manufacturer is doing it for another manufacturing of a different product with proprietary, uh, but they're able to share that part of it. So it can help. It can tell as far as a person, if a person's smiling, that particular app can seeing AI from Microsoft. It's an app that doesn't cost any. You can go to your, your you can go to the uh, Apple store and get that Microsoft seeing AI on your phone. You don't need to go to the Apple store. You just go on your phone. So, so tactile landmarks, develop your sense of touch. When you stop using your vision and you start exploring the basic things that you have, some of the orientation that you of what even is your phone, what your your phone or whatever it might be, uh, or anything, whether it's face up, face down, the right way or the wrong way, there may be a triangle on one side that you know that that's the way that something's going, or there may be little, there may be buttons on both sides. But the manufacturer had put grooves on the buttons on one side as opposed to the other. And so you know that that orientation always goes to the right or to the left when you're holding that device. All different types of things like that. Bump dots can be very important. Now, those are little adhesive sticky things in our idea shop. I -E -E -I -E -Y -E, I'm trying to say is for idea shop. E-Y-E for I. But... They're little sticky tabs that can that stay on a long time. You can put them on keys. If you have several keys, you can put them on the key. So whether it's low light or you don't know which key it is by sight, you can identify it quite easily by doing that. There's called a spot and line, which is a, like a puffy paint that you can put on certain things too. That doesn't come off as easy as these. The bump dots are able to be removed without damaging things. Sometimes spot and line does not work all that well. But... Also, be sensitive to changes in materials as far as giving you cues of where you're at or what you're doing. So it can be very important. How are we doing with time? Okay, good. So spot and line, the bump dots are on the top uh, left. Those are the orange dots, and there's a number of them there. There's other square ones as well. Spot and lines in the center. There's a tactile measuring tape. There's tactile dominoes. And I'm out of time, I see. But this is the liquid level indicator at the top left, those prongs. It's a battery with an orange hood on it that has two prongs. The prongs go into the cup. So when the liquid comes up and touches those prongs, that's when it makes a, a sound. 
the screeching sound, if you will, that lets you know that's full. The big thing that looks like a something that we that some of us are over 60 might have used uh, when we were in kindergarten uh, for our first pencil or something, but it's not. It's an audio labeler. You can put little plastic discs that are that have a associated impregnated type thing in them that so when you record what it is like this is my green shirt if you can do it on clothes as well and so you have that tag on there and you speak into it when you know what it, and then you put it in the closet and then you use this to identify where that green shirt is out of all the shirts in the closet a number of different things and also a big timer that could be used there's a variety of different devices you may start using your alexa amazon alexa it can be great. It can help with a lot of different things, timer-wise, a number of different things. I won't go into story. I have a story about a 33-year-old that was degenerative. He was going to lose most all of his control except probably his voice, and he'd lost all hope. That Amazon Echo gave him back hope. A variety of other things, whether it's a large screen magnification, and it don't have time to go into why those may be great, but the bottom right hand screen, that's what I did for years. That was one of the most single empowering things for people to stay independent their whole life if they have macular degeneration, because you don't go completely blind with macular degeneration unless it's another eye disease, because you still have your peripheral. But, anyways, so we have orientation and mobility indoors, outdoors. There, uh, you can use a white cane, but you have to really have orientation and mobility. Um, but you have to be a good uh, you have to be a good cane user before you can have a dog if you start losing your vision. Magnifiers are not all created equal. There's a variety of different ones. They they may look they do the same thing, but they're for different reasons. One's a handheld. The bottom one on the right corner is a stand magnifier. You don't pick it up even though it's a handle. And then there's an electronic one over on the side that kind of looks. Well, there's a picture, and then it looks like there's a bigger picture, but it's not sitting on the picture. Well, normally it would be sitting on the picture, and that would make that picture bigger in that particular area. You could change the magnification on that one. So what's new, there's all kinds of things. Opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities have an independent living program, whether you're in a congregate living, assisted living, not skilled nursing home, but assisted living or independent living or in your own home. Uh, certain criteria, uh, but you can go through services with us that Opportunities for Ohioans has provided funding for us, as well as they provide some products for you, depending on the need. Assistive technology, there's always new things. Low-tech solution, those bump dots are probably, those orange bump dots are probably in the beginning, they're one of the most independent giving things you could possibly get. There's always vision related news. If you don't do it and you have Google as a search engine, develop some Google alerts and put blindness and low vision in. I get those every week, every week. I only do it once a week because don't do it every day. You'll be barraged with those different things. But I'll tell you, you'll have to sort through some things, uh, but do two different blind and low vision. Um, Right now, we don't have any upcoming event. We just had an event yesterday where we there was a three-hour program where we talked about the aging eye and don't get tripped up, staying safe in your own home, as well as the overview about the uh, about the programs for opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities. Uh, so there's a, a few different things. So we probably will have that in the future. Uh, you can always check our website, clevelandsightcenter.org, for upcoming events. So. Uh, real rehabilitation service, low vision clinic for low vision exams. We have optometrists that specialize in low vision exams, uh, which is different than an ophthalmologist, an occupational therapist for vision. Uh, we help people. That's what we do. Our staff is dedicated. We go around the nine state, nine counties uh, that we're involved with. So, and to call if you want to become a client. You don't have to have a medical referral. We do need an eye report at some point, but it's 216-658-4567. And that concludes my formal presentation. I would love to hear some things from you.
Thank you so much, Tom. So much information to digest there. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you have any questions and would like to type them in the chat, you can. Um, otherwise, we can allow people to ask questions as well. Um, I, of course, have a couple because as you're talking, things are kind of clicking. You did mention they don't require a referral, so they don't need an order or prescription from their doctor. Good no. to know. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you work with all insurances or most, most of the major um, manage Medicare products? Well, that's the problem, which I didn't say in this particular thing, but insurance doesn't cover anything except the eye exam okay. or and the OT that's re okay. referred through our optometrist. Those are the only things, nothing else is covered. So we raise funds all the time for that because less than 10% uh, of the money that we receive for the whole budget of giving care to people is through government. So 90% is through private private donations and things of that nature, generate grants and all that type of stuff. Okay. And you, are you able to send someone out to the person's home to actually see their environment and make recommendations? Yes, we okay. do. That. We travel in nine counties. So our staff is itinerant. For eye exam, they would have to, the person would have to come here. And if they're having difficulty driving here, there may be transportation available for you to very nominal fee from us okay. as well. So but that's all part of the registration process. That number that I gave four, five, six, seven is it's different. It's a registration process, but it's not somebody that's just taking your name. Okay. It's like telling you about the different things that are available, interested in what you might be interested in. You may not even know. And some of the questions that they may ask say, now I'm, now I'm thinking, yeah, I, I'd be interested in that too, or whatever it might be from what you want to do, not the services that you want. And then, okay. then we would assign a case manager and say, go over it with you again. What is it you'd like to do? How can we help you do that? That's the whole process. We want to come along and empower that person, not with what we want to do, but what they want to do. So it can be very, very good. So great. Great to see such customer individual centered care, certainly. Yes. yes. Um, I was just going to ask this question as well. Someone else is asking, you know, we service our members throughout the entire state of Ohio and into Massachusetts and some other states as well. Is there um, a certain way that we could research similar type resources? You know, obviously not all are created equal. Right, right. But yeah. Well, there's, there, you're, you're exactly right. The problem is that many site centers have gone out of business. The one in Columbus went out of business in like 2010. Wow. Uh, and they don't all provide the same services because there's no funding. And mm -hmm. so if you're not fundraising and you haven't got an endowment and those types of things, but um, do check for site centers. Uh, they're they're going to be nonprofit, but like in Miami Valley, Dayton area, Goodwill does some things, but it generally will only do that through orders from Opportunities for Ohioans with Disability. So if you have that, if you have vision loss, you may contact Opportunities for Ohioans with Disability in Ohio. Okay. Uh, and they may have somebody that would contract or something or give you some ideas if you're out of the Northeast Ohio area. Okay. There is one in Toledo. It's called Northwest Site Center. Uh, I think it's the it's named something like that, Northwest, but they also call it Toledo Site Center. So if you just put Site Center in the Toledo area and they travel 16 counties. So oh, wow. they come to, um, so there's there's a few, but it's very but they don't necessarily have all the services that we have. Or at the point that I was involved with them, I used to go out and do some things in conjunction with them as well. But uh, in other states, the opportunity the the program that I referenced for opportunities with Ohioans that were funded it's a federal program actually, even though the state okay. coming through that. So it's called Independent Living Older Blind federally is what it's called. Even though you don't have to be blind. Yeah, mm -hmm. criteria. That's what the federal government calls it. So look for somebody that may be doing that. And okay. if they're doing that, they probably would do what we do too, is if somebody doesn't fall within that criteria, they may provide services as well. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Definitely helpful. Thank you. It's hard to figure out where to begin. Oh, it is. It's, it's true. That. Absolutely. Don't see any other questions. Um, Sue, do you have anybody that is looking to ask a question aside from putting it in the chat? I do not. Great. 
Well, Tom, we appreciate you being with us today and providing so much information. There's certainly lots of things as an occupational therapist I wasn't even aware is available. So yes. we look forward to having these resources Wonderful. for our members and knowing how to contact um, the Cleveland Site Center. So Excellent. thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye.